Okay. Um, I am now starting the session on Bayesian analysis for bilingualism research. Um, if you've seen uh, Stefano's presentation, um, you know that we don't really have time in such short sessions to, to give really a detailed um, procedure for running this analysis, but I hope that these sessions can um, will allow you to, to at least contact with the basic principles of these approaches and, uh, and also their advantages of these methods, also including some practical examples. Uh, there is an accompanying script to my uh, to my presentation, as well as slides and data sets. You will find them in this link. It's called tinyurl.com, tinyurl.com, and then Bayesian ISB 14. Uh, however, if you already have these packages installed that I'll be using, then feel free to, to run the script at the same time. If you don't have these packages installed or if, if your system is not set up for this, I would uh, recommend that you don't and maybe just do this after the session so that you can follow what I'm saying rather than worrying about the code and packages, et cetera. Also, the models that I'm going to be using, they have already been fitted. And so you can load these models instead of having to actually fit them, which, in the Bayesian framework takes a little bit of time, unlike with frequentist statistics. A little bit of background on what Bayesian statistics are. Bayesian approaches are usually presented in opposition to frequentist statistics or frequentist approaches. Uh, in proper statistical uh, application and science, there is a debate about these frameworks with very convoluted and complicated questions that are even philosophical in a way about the nature of probability, etc. In this session, we're going to take a more pragmatic stance. The way I see it, Bayesian statistics is very useful because it allows us to do more things, more things more easily, some things more easily, other things uh, it's a bit more difficult, but it essentially allows us to do a better, um, more generalizable uh, statistical inference, in my view. And we can do that with within this kind of integrated framework, an integrated conceptual framework of, of the Bayesian principles, but also an integrated technical framework, because for the most part, we're going to be using the BRMS package for R, which allows us to fit many, many different models, uh, many, many different kinds of Bayesian models. BRMS in turn uses the STAN probabilistic programming language, um, which then allows you to, to do everything you might want with the same package functions and, and principles. The use of Bayesian statistics as, uh, is now uh, quite uh, common in, in certain fields within linguistics and psychology. Um, still not mainstream, but it's getting to be quite common. It's part of these general trends that seem to be happening in data analysis, a trend from frequentist statistics to Bayesian statistics, and at the same time, a trend from strict hypothesis testing to uh, more uh, emphasis on estimating effects along with their uncertainty. And for the most part, all of this session will take place within this cell here. Where we're going to be doing Bayesian statistics for the purposes of estimation with uncertainty. And these are, I think, trends um, that have um, some, some clear advantages and that are now more common within uh, linguistics and psychology, but also already in bilingualism research. I should say that the goal of this session is not really to convert anyone, and this is not really about choosing one side or the other. There are many reasonable applications for both hypothesis, hypothesis testing and frequentist statistics. I want to introduce you to this framework and its associated tools because I think that this approach has substantial advantages over the more traditional um, um, statistical approaches that we know and love. Um, here is a list, uh, certainly not exhaustive, but already quite long of uh, advantages or some of the advantages that I find in Bayesian statistics. I'll just go through them throughout the session, so we won't go through all of them now, but I'd like to focus right now on the very first one, which is that Bayesian statistics allows us to solve or at least ameliorate some long-standing problems with null hypothesis significance testing. And in particular, precisely because we can focus on estimation and uncertainty when assessing effects. 
what are these problems with null hypothesis significance testing? Well, even though this is very widely adopted and you just need to open any kind of paper in bilingualism uh, to see p-values and frequency statistics, we know that it has substantial problems. One of them is that it emphasizes binary decisions such as there is an effect versus there is no effect. And that may very well be what one wants for certain purposes, but is oftentimes not what one wants or not the most important thing when doing scientific um, research. Uh, in a way, these kinds of decisions, is there an effect, there is no effect, they impoverish our statistical inferences, which should be uh, richer, I, I believe, and our models already provide a lot more information than these uh, simply uh, the dichotomous decisions. At the same time, if we're focusing on effect versus no effect, this kind of, of, of mentality tends to encourage the application of very mechanical procedures, very dogmatic procedures, and procedures that we don't think about. So we'll look at that p-value, and if the criterion is not the p-value, if it's a t-value above two, then we'll look at the t-value. We don't care about our estimates or the properties of our model. What we really want is to get that p below 0.05. Uh, and for good reasons, of course, because then maybe we'll publish or get tenure or whatever it may be. Um, like Stefano said in his presentation, there is a lot of problems with this mentality, and it really encourages a bit of uh, lack of thinking, so to speak. This has long been pointed out, for example, by Giger Renzer already in 93. He already said that this dogmatism, this obsession with the p-values had lasted already half a century and that we needed knowledgeable use of statistics rather than a collective compulsive obsession that the field seems to have fallen uh, into. At the same time, Gigerenzer also warned us in 93 not to replace this dogmatism by a new one, for example, Bayesian. And so, of course, the goal is always to understand what the data is telling us, the properties of our models to achieve the best scientific inference possible and not really to fall into these mindless procedures. So what are the fundamental principles of Bayesian statistics, in my view, at least? Um, there are three very important Bayesian principles. I'll go through them one at a time and explain how they relate to the research that we might actually want to conduct within, within the, bilingual, the field of bilingualism. First one is that the parameters in our models, and by parameters, I mean any kind of regression intercept, slope, whatever it may be, for example, a difference between means or, or a slope, uh, so an effect. Um, uh, these are not single values, but they are full probability distributions. They are continuous distributions. And so instead of fitting a model and saying the regression slope of the difference between means was or is 70 milliseconds, in fact, when we estimate such differences, we are dealing with full probability distributions over a range of values. So we actually have something like this. A panel on the left would be a regression intercept. The panel on the right is a regression slope. And we'll fit this model in a little bit so you know what this actually uh, means. But for now, what matters is that we can see that we have this range of values expressed as a probability um, distribution. And this is what we get. We don't get the single value. This is what the regression slope essentially is in um, the Bayesian um, framework. <clears throat> um, this is the data set that I use to produce those plots. Um, if you're following along uh, with the script, then you can actually load this data set and you can also load the model that, um, that was fitted. Um, this data set comes from a study with L2 learners that uh, me and uh, collaborators have conducted on uh, predicting morphological processing from age of acquisition, specifically from the age at which uh, 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 second language acquisition had begun. This was done with um, German second language speakers, second language speakers of German, uh, with uh, Turkish as their L1. And in this experiment, what we did was we presented prime words subliminally for 50 milliseconds only, and these prime words could be related in different ways to the target word. Participants had to make a decision to the target, specifically a lexical decision to say if it was a word or not, 
But before they made that decision, the target was preceded by uh, three different types of prime. An unrelated prime, such as parked boil, and then we had two different types of morphological relatedness. Boiled boil, which is inflectional, and boiler boil, which is a derivational um, relation. And we wanted to see if these effects, so the response times, which was the crucial measure here to the target, if these effects were um, <clears throat> were um, predicted by age of acquisition as well as other uh, individual characteristics. We can actually load this data set by uh, the read RDS function and we'll find this data set within this RDS file. Uh, if you look at this data set, we have one row per participant, so we're not yet uh, conducting a mixed effects model. This is just a simple regression with just one predictor, very simple example. So we got acquainted to how to do this within the Bayesian framework. Uh, if you love this data set, then you have two columns. One is the amount of inflectional priming. This is already a subtraction. So it's a subtraction of RTs to this condition, boiled boil versus this one, parked boil. So the amount of inflectional priming means that um, if this uh, number is positive, it means that you were faster at responding to boil after seeing boiled than after seeing parked. And so this data set has already been aggregated so that you get this simple dependent measure. It's also a subset of the subjects that were used in the original paper. Uh, in the original paper, we had these two groups uh, under and over five. Um, and um, uh, and so you, you already have a lot of simplification that wouldn't really be, be usually done in a, in a real analysis, but, uh, but for the purposes or the pedagogical purposes here, it will suffice. What we, what we will do is first, we're going to run a frequentist linear regression. So predicting inflectional priming, amount of inflectional priming from age of acquisition, and then we will run a Bayesian linear regression model and you can see how the two will compare. So first, our traditional frequentist model, we're going to use the LM function, of course, to run a simple linear regression. <laughs> we are predicting inflectional priming from AOA. I also use a centering function here. This simply centers the predictor around its mean. And I can do this, that from right within uh, the regression formula. And then I'm calling the summary function on the model that I have just fitted. And so this is the classic uh, regression output in which you get your estimate, your standard error, your T value and your P value. And we can see here that we had a uh, significant effect of age of acquisition on inflectional priming. This effect is negative. And so the, uh, the, the higher the, the, the age of acquisition, so the later these participants have started acquiring German, then the lower the magnitude of their inflectional priming in this task, which we interpret as um, some sort of efficiency in decomposing um, uh, inflected forms. Um, <clears throat> we can plot the fitted values of this frequentist model. Here I'm using the GGEM means function, which uses uh, behind it the EM means package to, to get the model predictions, but you could use whatever else uh, suits uh, your taste. And we can see here this um, quite strong, but also pretty variable uncertain effect of AOA on inflectional priming. So if you've acquired your L2 very early on at age five, then you show a decent amount of inflectional priming, maybe around 45 milliseconds. And if you acquired your L2 much, much later, so for example, at age 30, this actually turns into an inhibition effect. However, you can see that the effect around here, it's actually quite uncertain. And this is because we didn't really have that many subjects with these uh, extreme ages of acquisition. But you can see here that we're really not sure about what happens here. And perhaps there is an inhibition effect or perhaps um, not. Now we can conduct the Bayesian counterpart of this simple linear regression. Uh, this will be very simple to set up. 
we will use the BRMS package, as I've mentioned, uh, that was created by Paul Buchner. Um, the BRMS package has a number of convenient functions, the most important of which is the BRM function for Bayesian regression model that allows fitting Bayesian regression models. And it takes exactly the same kind of formula as you would be used to when using R. So for example, when using LM or when using Elmer, as um, as um, Ian and, and George have shown you, you can use pretty much the same formulas and then you have some extensions to the standard formulas that are specific to the BRMS package. I say this is very simple to set up and indeed it is in terms of writing the commands, but of course, as everything in life, it comes with difficulties. Um, one may run, for example, into memory problems. Bayesian models are very memory intensive in terms of RAM memory. There could be other difficulties and different kinds of warnings and error messages. I don't really have time in this session to go, uh, to go through all of them. But generally speaking, the output of the PRMS package will tell you more or less what you should do whenever something went wrong, or it will provide a link to a web page. It will tell you maybe you should increase this value to see if this works. Of course, you should learn a little bit about what these errors mean, but um, unlike other, other R packages, PRMS is actually pretty good as, at telling you what to do next. Uh, and I should also point out this very important caveat. A real Bayesian analysis would require a few more steps, and we're going to see some of these steps uh, still in the session and other steps that I won't uh, mention at all for lack of time. But it, this is basically for you to get acquainted with this approach and to see how it works and its advantages. I'm not saying that in order to actually run and report a Bayesian analysis uh, in a paper that all you need to do is write this one command. There are a number of steps involved. And if you want to move into this world, you'll need to get acquainted with uh, a complete Bayesian workflow, so to speak. Um, for introductory purposes, I think this will do for now. What we do then is we run our Bayesian regression model. Again, exactly the same formula. We predict inflectional priming from the centered predictor of age of acquisition of German. And that's all we need to do. If you're running the script, what uh, you can do is this function will uh, call the model that is already fitted because we can tell it to where the model is in terms of its file name. And so it will retrieve that. And because it's already fitted in the same folder, um, then you will be able to load the fitted model instead of waiting. Um, this is the output of a Bayesian regression model. Again, we have the same parameters as we did in the frequentist model. We have our regression intercept and we have our regression slope. We also have sigma, so the, the, the standard deviation of the residuals, the unexplained variance in our model. The format looks a bit different. So for example, we have no T values or no P values. We also have some diagnostic measures here at the end. This essentially tells us that everything uh, went right. You want this R hat value to be as close to 1.00 as possible lower than 1.01, .01, and it basically says that the model has converged and that everything uh, went as planned. If we look at the estimates, they're actually very similar to the estimates that we have obtained before in our frequentist model. So here we have 363. If I go back to the frequentist model, we have 365. And so it's actually a very similar um, results. However, <clears throat> This reported estimate, the 363, is just the mean of a full probability distribution. So we shouldn't reduce the statistical inference to this one value. This is just the mean of a full distribution. This distribution is made up of samples. Bayesian fitting uh, requires sampling. And in this case, by default, the model um, uh, arrives at um, 4,000 samples for each parameter. And we can obtain them, for example, using this as draws df function. We just apply this function to the model and we get essentially all the samples. So we get the full probability distribution for each parameter. Here I have the intercept. The fixed effects are prefixed with a b. So I have b intercept and here I have my slope. Uh, 
age of acquisition of German. And then for each of these samples, I have a value. So we don't really have one value for this parameter. We have essentially 4,000 values. And it looks like this. We can then plot the posterior samples and we get then our full uh, probability distribution. This is what we call the posterior distribution of the parameter. And it's really very informative and rich about the possible values of parameters. So what this is telling me is essentially that uh, my the, the, the true effect of age of acquisition. So, so we need to remember here that age of acquisition was expressed in years. And so this is how many milliseconds less of priming you have for each year that you've learned German uh, later at. So uh, it's, it's the effect per year. And that's why it's so small and we're talking about three milliseconds because it's per one year. So for example, comparing a person who learned uh, German at, uh, at seven versus at six, let's say. Um, <clears throat> what, we, what we then see here is this full distribution of values. And the peak means that these values are more likely. So it's likely that the true effect of age of acquisition is around three milliseconds per year in the population. So I'm trying to generalize from what I have observed. And it's likely that the true effect is within this range, say three to four uh, milliseconds per year. And it's possible, but less likely that this effect is very small and close to zero. It's even possible that it goes in the other direction. It's possible that it's a positive effect rather than a negative effect. But as you can see, this is much more unlikely compared to uh, a negative effect of magnitude around three or four. And it's also possible, although unlikely, that this is quite extreme, let's say around eight milliseconds per, per year. Um, so you can see that I'm interpreting this uh, distribution as probabilities of the true effect. I'm doing statistical inference to try and go beyond my sample and to get some uh, inkling of what this true effect out there in the population looks like. And I'm straightforward interpreting this as probabilities of the true effect. And this is a huge advantage of Bayesian statistics. It's a conceptual advantage, one that we often don't think about, but it's one of the best advantages of Bayesian statistics, which is that precisely uh, Bayesian posteriors give us the probability of the different values of a parameter given the data. How does this differ from frequentist statistics? Well, another problem with null hypothesis statistical testing is that the p-value is very often incorrectly interpreted. It is often interpreted as the probability that the null hypothesis is true. And so if we get a p-value of 0.05, we say, well, there's only 5% of probability, 5% chance that there is no effect between in the population so that there is no difference between these means, that the two means are equal, that there is that this regression slope is flat, whatever it may be. Um, this, is, this is very wrong. Uh, alternatively, we can also interpret this as the probability of the alternative hypothesis being true, which is an even worse interpretation. So for example, saying that we're 95% sure that the effect exists. All of these interpretations are, are fundamentally wrong because p-values cannot provide such probabilities. Um, so the whole field is based on this notion, but uh, and frequency statistics are good at doing certain things and, and, and at fulfilling their purpose. It's just that in a way we are over interpreting p-values when we think that they mean the probability of parameter values or of hypotheses. And the reason is that these two questions are actually very different, even though they look the same. The first one is given that the null hypothesis is true, what is the probability of obtaining this data? And the other one is, given that I have obtained this data, what is the probability of the null hypothesis? And these two things are actually fundamentally different, but we have trouble with this. Our brains have trouble with this inversion of conditional probabilities. Um, even if we're scientists, it's very easy to kind of confuse these um, two uh, probabilities. So the p-value is really the probability of obtaining this data or more extreme, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. 
the conditional probability formalism would say probability of the data given the null hypothesis. And what we might actually want to know, or typically we would know, is the probability of certain hypotheses or parameter values given the obtained data. So we actually want it to be the other way around. We want the probability of the hypothesis. How likely is it that the hypothesis is true or not, given that I have seen this data? And so mathematically, these are two completely different things, and frequency statistics can only go so far. Now, Bayesian statistics can essentially turn one into the other. The, the person that came up with that was called Pace, Thomas Pace, hence giving the name to Bayesian statistics. And Thomas Pace, Reverend Thomas Pace, um, came up with a formula that allows us to turn one conditional probability into the other. So turn the uh, probability of B given A into probability of A given B, as long as we do some mathematical magic with it. And because of that uh, mathematical fact, we can actually interpret the probabilities, these posterior probabilities that we get from our uh, regression models as probabilities of the actual effects. And so in this sense, we are going beyond what p-values can, can actually tell us. <clears throat> um, also important, these posterior distributions they also encode our uncertainty about the effect. So we're trying to estimate the magnitude of this effect and the posterior distribution itself tells me essentially how certain or uncertain, how confident I can be about certain ranges of values. So if these posteriors are very, very wide, well, that just means that many, many values are possible. We simply do not know what the true effect may be. It could be 1,000, it could be minus 1,000. We don't know. The posterior is huge. It means that we have a lot of uncertainty about our inferences. If, in turn, these posteriors are very, very narrow and congregate around a specific set of values, then we can be much more confident that the true value is indeed inside this small region. And so our certainty about the effect uh, is, is larger. And it's important to keep this in mind then that the full posterior is both a technique of estimation, but it also enco encodes or formalizes in some way our uncertainty about the effects. So if you see a very, very tight posterior, that means that we can be really, really sure that the effect is within those boundaries. We typically use what we call credible intervals to characterize such bounds. Bayesian statistics provides credible intervals, not confidence intervals. They can easily be obtained by using this posterior summary function on the samples. And of course, if I go back, they came out in the model output as well. You can see here the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval, the upper bound of the 95% credible intervals, sorry, I said confidence, but these are credible intervals. It's just a force of habit. And here you can see the lower bound of the 95% credible interval for the slope of interest and the upper bound. So we are 95% sure that the effect of range of acquisition, of course, given the assumptions of the model, none of this is, is of course, set in stone. We're always conditioning on the assumptions that we've made. Um, but we can be 95% sure there is 95% probability that the slope of interest is within these two bounds. Um, and so these are, uh, these are different from um, confidence intervals. Uh, even though this is usually how confidence intervals are interpreted. We, we look at the confidence interval and we say, I'm 95% sure that the effect is within these two bounds. Again, we cannot do this because frequency statistics don't allow turning one conditional probability into the other. Uh, so even though we interpret them like that, this is a wrong interpretation. Uh, but with Bayesian statistics, we can actually say that there is 95% probability that the true value is inside the 95% bounds of the credible interval. Um, 
they can be reported as such, these credible intervals, this is what I would typically write uh, in a paper, something like that, an effect of age of acquisition of minus 3.6 milliseconds per year, and then 95% credible interval, and I give the two bounds. Uh, it's also convenient oftentimes to actually show the, the, the posterior distribution. There are, there are packages that will do this for you and you can plot all of the estimates in a model in terms of these little uh, density plots that can show the full posterior. Uh, perhaps one of the best ways of doing it is overlaying the bounds of the credible interval as well as the mean of the posterior distribution over the, the, the density plot that characterizes the posterior. This is probably the, the most efficient and, and easy to understand way of uh, summarizing a posterior distribution. One can do this with the ggdist package, which is very convenient for these um, visualization purposes. <clears throat> and then you ask, great, we have all this richness and all this, um, this um, gradiency, but is there an effect or not? Well, from the point of view of estimation, uh, this is not really the right way of, of phrasing this question. It is possible to phrase the question as such in Bayesian statistics, but I'm focusing here on this um, estimation-based approach. And from the point of view of estimation, you wouldn't want to ask something like, is there an effect? Because it simply reduces uh, all these magnitudes and all these probabilities and all this uh, richness to a very simple directional statement. The AOA effect is negative, yes or no. Now, it may be that our theories don't really care. It may be that our theory is equally comfortable with uh, an effect of minus one millisecond or minus 10 or minus 100. Uh, but this probably says something, and it probably says that our theory isn't specific enough or good enough to really generate specific predictions if it doesn't care about the magnitudes of effects. Uh, from this perspective of doing statistical inference as such, I would say that we should be interested in quantifying the probabilities of the different magnitudes of the effects of interest, pretty much like Stefano said in his presentation, we're kind of moving away from this dichotomous decisions based on p-values to this kind of uh, probabilistic and gradient world. So how would I characterize such an effect uh, if I wanted to emphasize estimation? Well, maybe I would say something like, uh, the most likely or probable or plausible effect of AOA would be a reduction of priming by 3.6 milliseconds per year with a 95% probability that this reduction is within these bounds. I would probably also say that the most probable values for this slope are negative. And so it is very likely that each year of age of acquisition reduces inflectional priming by a few milliseconds. By and large, almost all of this posterior was on the negative side. And so it seems that these are the more likely values for this effect. I would also say that the magnitude of this effect is likely to be relatively large. Of course, it's three milliseconds and that sounds small, but uh, we can think that a person who learned German 10 years later than another would be expected to show a substantial reduction in inflectional priming that would be about uh, 36 milliseconds. This is something that we can do in Bayesian statistics. We can simply grab the posterior samples and do more operations on them, transformations, comparisons, subtractions, averages, whatever we may want. We may grab these posteriors and then do things with them to reach further conclusions or perform additional comparisons. And here I'm simply multiplying all the posterior samples by 10. And I say, okay, if the effect of AOA <laughs> then um, I'm looking at the effect over 10 years of age of acquisition. And then I would expect, of course, I'm just multiplying everything by 10, I would expect a 36 millisecond reduction uh, in inflectional priming, which still might not sound like much if you don't work with priming experiments, but this is the amount of priming in native speakers for uh, uh, inflectional priming. We typically, in this paradigm of mask priming, we typically get magnitudes around 30, 40 milliseconds. And so this kind of reduction over 10 years of AOA seems um, uh, large enough for it to be interpreted and 
it has consequences for our um, scientific explanation. At the same time, one should say that it is possible, however unlikely, but it is possible that the true effect will turn out to be quite small and perhaps even in the opposite direction. And so here I'm saying, well, it could even be smaller than 0 0.8 milliseconds per year with 2.5% probability. I'm just using the bounds of the credible interval here to say, well, it could be quite small, but that's only 2.5% chance. Um, and so this is the kind of interpretation that I would, uh, would favor. Oftentimes, I don't actually write like this. I, I have been trained in a different tradition. And of course, there are many um, incentives and demands on us whenever we're working with collaborators, whenever we're writing our papers for publication. This is something that is continuously evolving. You'll probably find much more uh, categorical, old-fashioned statements in my own papers, but this is what I'm trying to move to and to perform more estimation-based um, inferences. Now, how does the Bayesian trick work? This Bayesian trick, I'll go back, the Bayesian trick that Reverend Thomas Bayes came up with, how does the mathematical trick work? Why is it that Bayes can give us what we want, which is probabilities of parameter values? Well, it does that by bringing in additional information. It does that by integrating into the statistical inference prior knowledge. And one cannot have those conclusions in terms of probabilities of values or hypotheses without bringing in the prior knowledge. So this is just something that is required in Bayesian statistics. You need to go and formalize what you already knew before seeing the data. And this is what will allow that formula to uh, work. So what is prior knowledge? Well, it's, it's precisely whatever we already knew in advance. It's whatever we already knew uh, independently of the data a priori. So how likely was it that this difference, this regression slope, whatever it may be, was 20 milliseconds or whatever other value before I actually conducted my experiment. It's a bit of a strange concept if we're not used to thinking about this, but uh, in order to do base, we need to turn this into a formalization and we need to say, indeed, um, this was what I believed before I conducted my experiment. And these prior beliefs, just like the posterior beliefs or the posterior distributions uh, are also these continuous probability distributions. And the way Bayesian inference works is we have what we already knew before seeing the data, so a distribution of the prior beliefs. Then we have what the data contributes, and we will call this the likelihood in, in statistical uh, jargon. And this is essentially the, the current evidence. And then what Bayesian inference does is kind of a compromise between the two, depending on the magnitudes and the widths of these distributions, it will find essentially a middle ground. And this is what we can conclude uh, from our experiment. We're essentially integrated, integrating what we already knew with what the current evidence or likelihood has uh, provided. And so really Bayesian inference is a kind of belief updating we believed something, we see the data, and we probably change our belief, perhaps in some direction, and then we'll probably see more data and continuously change our belief. This kind of belief updating is characterized by the, the Bayes' theorem equation. Um, people may find this strange if you haven't been exposed to this before. Uh, some people worry that this is a subjective process, that we may need to, to, to say something about our prior beliefs, and why should that even matter in terms of data analysis? But in reality, we already use such knowledge. Whenever we see published findings, we bring up our expert knowledge, our domain-specific knowledge about these effects and tasks and populations, and we then arrive at a conclusion inside our own mind. Bayesian statistics essentially asks us to formalize this more explicitly as part of the model itself, but um, but it's a process that we already do. So, for example, if I told you that a study found that IQ was lower in bilinguals compared to monolinguals, even if that is significant, 
you probably will not extract very big claims from this. You will probably think that maybe there are some confounds that maybe these populations weren't carefully selected or matched, that maybe this is something specific to that sample, but you're really not going to say things about bilinguals being less or more smart uh, than monolinguals on the basis of a p-value. And this is because you know something about the field that allows you not to take a 0.05 as um, uh, godly truth. In the same vein, if I told you that the risk of dementia is halved in bilinguals compared to monolinguals, you might even believe that bilingualism has protective effects or reserve effects that will help you uh, against uh, aging or even preventing dementia. But you probably know that the risk of dementia will not be so uh, so reduced by bilingualism. You have a sense of how much this experience matters, and it may matter quite a lot, but maybe if I said that this risk was, was, was reduced in half, you would find that a bit uh, unlikely, even if it is significant. And so our prior beliefs also concern magnitudes of effects. We know that certain effects are just too big to be true, uh, even if the p-value is significant, and even if they were very big within a particular sample. Likewise, if I said that a very robust repli replicated effect, like the Stroop effect, for example, was not significant in any given particular study, that does not make you change your beliefs that the Stroop doesn't exist. We know that the Stroop effect exists. There has been very much, much work uh, uh, showing that. And so one given p-value is not going to change our beliefs about this. Basically, we have prior knowledge about all of these effects. And the p-value by itself is not really what determines our inference. And this is the critical point. Our conclusions, our inferences, are actually underdetermined by the data. So we know more than what the data is saying, and we're bringing that and putting it together with the data to arrive at our conclusions. So indeed, if an outcome is very obvious or expected, uh, then, of course, it is more believable, even if it's not significant, but it's very believable because it's very expected. If an outcome of an experiment is extremely surprising or unexpected, if it clearly challenges previous evidence, well, then we may want to see a very, very small p-value, or we might want to see three experiments showing it, or we might want to see independent labs replicating this with different populations. So when a result is really surprising and unexpected, we demand more evidence and stronger data. This is just another way of saying that um, uh, extraordinary claims um, require uh, extraordinary evidence. So if you're saying something that really goes against um, previous knowledge, then you better provide more evidence for that. And it's exactly that process that Bayesian statistics formalizes. So just like the posteriors could be narrower when we're super confident or wider when we're super unsure. The same thing happens uh, with regard to the priors. So we can have strong or weak priors, more or less informative priors. We could think that we may have, for example, three different types of priors. I'm going to call them strong, weak, and non-informative, which is uh, generally the terms that are used, or weakly informative and non-informative. A non-informative prior is basically everything goes. I don't know anything about this effect. And this, by the way, is actually how frequent this statistics works, because we're neglecting the prior. We're essentially saying everything is possible. And this would apply to a value of 300 milliseconds, a value of 3000 milliseconds, or a value of 3 million milliseconds. I'm saying, I don't know in advance, but we can also have a weak prior in which I say, well, you know, it could be a hundred, it could be minus a hundred, it could go in each direction, but I don't really know. It could have different magnitudes. Or I could have a strong prior. In this case, it's centered at zero, but it could even be positive or negative. And I could have a strong prior about an effect. And I would say, look, I know that in this task, with this population, with this manipulation, most likely I'm going to find an effect within those bounds. And I'm bringing that knowledge in. Uh, and so we have priors with different degrees of information. And then they essentially get combined with the data. If I have a strong prior and weak data, 
well, then the influence of the prior is much larger. Imagine that the data is super noisy, very small sample, very variable. Essentially, the prior can compensate for the noise in the data. What this says is that maybe this experiment hasn't taught us anything. So if my prior and my posterior are basically the same, because my prior was strong and the data was weak, then it just means that I haven't learned anything from the data, which makes sense because it was very weak data. On the other hand, if I have a weak prior and strong data, then the influence of the data is much larger. And then our prior beliefs are not very constraining. And so the data is really more allowed to speak for itself in a way, because you're saying, well, I didn't believe much to begin with. And now let's see what this experiment says. And so the prior and the data or the likelihood are essentially getting combined in this way, and they may have different relative uh, strengths or degrees of, of information. And so, like I said, this is uh, a formalization of this principle that if indeed something is completely outside of a strong belief, so completely unexpected, then it would need to be super strong data in order to move or shift our beliefs in a meaningful way. So if we now go to the previous model that we fitted, we will see that using this function prior summary, we will see that indeed for the slope by default, because we didn't worry about priors, the RMS uses flat priors. That means completely non-informative, anything goes. I mean, by not setting a prior, you're essentially saying that everything is possible and that you know zero uh, in advance of the experiment. <laughs> But we can uh, change uh, the, the, the prior and perhaps even in some cases changing this prior ideally before you collect the data. But it's also something we don't need to be super strict about this. this it's also something that can be done after um, collecting the data as long as you're transparent about this and you show the effects of, of different priors. Um, sometimes having a different prior may really constrain our inference and make it more believable and more, more generalizable. So when we saw this, this regression slope that I've shown you before, well, it, in a way, it's quite extreme. And I know that it's quite extreme because I work in this area. And if I go here and see uh, what is the predicted effect for a person with 30 years of age, uh, sorry, that acquired a second language at 30, um, I can see that this is actually turning into inhibition. But then if I look at 40 years, then this is actually quite a large inhibitory effect. And the, these kinds of magnitudes that go between say 50 and, and, and uh, even more than minus 50, it's simply a range that we don't usually see in these mask priming tasks. So knowing what I know about this task and this population, and these kinds of effects, to me, it seems a bit too large. It's what the data said, yes, but if I ran it again, I probably wouldn't expect something as large. <laughs> and so we can constrain our inferences by using the stronger prior. What I'm going to do here is use this function prior to say, look, with regards to regression slopes, I actually have a strong prior that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 2.5. And so I'm doing that because I know how normal distributions work. And if I say that, I'm basically saying, well, there's 95% probability that the effect for one year of AOA is five milliseconds to minus five milliseconds. And that seems much more constrained given what I know in terms of the documented differences that exist between L1 speakers and late learners. And so in advance, I already had this knowledge and I'm now bringing this into my model. I fit my model with this stronger prior. And what happened is that now the effect became smaller. I now have a slope of minus 2.69 instead of minus 3.6. And I can plot both regression lines to see how the model's predictions have changed. The original one in the red line and the black line is my model with the stronger prior. I'm basically saying, look, this slope is probably not that large. And so now it has been pushed a little bit towards zero to satisfy 
the requirements of my prior. In my opinion, this is actually a more believable and more generalizable inference. So if I did this experiment several times, I'm, I think, more likely to find something like this um, black line rather than the red line. And I could achieve uh, this inference by bringing in the prior. Of course, people then worry, how do I choose the prior? There are some guidelines here in this link, and most of the time we need to have expert knowledge, but I would just advise you not to uh, fret about this too much, not to, not to worry too much. The important thing is recognizing that we already possess that knowledge. We have a sense of how big effects tend to be in our field. We really usually have a sense uh, about tasks and measures and populations and what kind of effects we usually find. We would be surprised if we found 200 millisecond effects in a mass priming uh, task. And that, that surprise is precisely the notion that we already expect something in the form of prior knowledge. We can also look at meta-analysis, effects from similar studies, et cetera. And you can look at this link for more prior choice recommendations. People also worry that then your beliefs are influencing what you conclude. And in my opinion, that's absolutely fine. Fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we already use the prior when interpreting results, as I tried to show to you. As long as we define the priors transparently, as long as we can reasonably discuss them, as long as we justify them, then there's nothing wrong. And in fact, there's only things that are right about bringing this aspect to the analysis. Just like we justify any other aspect of data analysis, we also justify things like outlier removal, participant removal, uh, transformation of the data, um, uh, presence or absence of covariates, uh, random effect structures, etc. And this is another aspect of the model that you're bringing in and that you need to justify. Um, of course, the, the reviewers may ask you to justify your priors and perhaps even say, look, I don't believe that this prior is reasonable. And that's fine. We, one can have a meaningful discussion about this just like we do about other aspects of data analysis. Always remember that the goal is not to characterize what's happening in your data. If that was the goal, we would simply look at the data. The goal is and provide like descriptive statistics. The goal is to arrive at the best and most generalizable inference beyond the sample. And so the prior is really helping us getting to something that is more believable outside of our sample in the population rather than in the data. Um, we don't really want to know what's going on in the data. And so the prior is allowing us to generalize. So I hope I've convinced you that there are a lot of interesting advantages about Bayesian statistics. We looked at the first four already, um, that we can bring in priors, that we can focus on estimation, that we can solve the problems of NHST. Uh, in order to conclude now, we still have about 10 minutes in order to conclude, I'll just show you another important advantage of Bayesian statistics, which is that it facilitates the modeling of variance components. There are other advantages here. Bayesian models are very flexible. They accommodate many different distribution families. They are robust to noise and extreme values. I don't really have much to say about that because of reasons of, of, of time but I would like to focus just a little bit on this modeling of the variance components. You heard in um, Ian and George's presentation that we need to specify a random effect structure whenever we conduct mixed effects models. And you also heard that this is important in order to appropriately account for the variance in the data and not uh, be overconfident about our estimates. And you also heard that sometimes these more complex models can uh, not fit properly, lead to convergence errors, singular fits, uh, badly estimated correlation parameters, like Ian said, et cetera. In order to demonstrate how Bayesian statistics can solve some of those problems, I have a data set there in that folder that is also a priming experiment, also with the same three conditions, inflection, derivation, and control. This was done in collaboration with Ian Cunnings. Uh, but this data set is in the long format. So we have one row for each uh, trial. And so each of these rows is the same participant. Uh, but again, it's the same design as before. One difference is that the primes were shown for longer, and that's one reason why we might expect uh, different effects. 
we can see here that we have a number of controlled trials, a number of derived trials, and a number of inflected trials for each person. And of course, the data is clustered. And like Ian and George said, we need then to conduct a mixed effects model. If we run a, a frequentist mixed effects model on this data, here I'm only worrying about participant, not item, just for reasons of simplicity. But if I fit the straight up mixed effects model on this data, what I get is some interpretable coefficients, yes, but I get these messed up correlation parameters between the random effects. And so the model, like Ian said, is finding it really hard to estimate these correlation parameters. And it's going to crazy estimates for the correlation um, uh, parameters, yeah. Uh, this model here uses treatment contrasts. And so we can interpret this as the amount of priming. Derived is faster than control. Inflected is faster than control by 72 or 75 milliseconds. Uh, like George said, we should probably transform the RTs. I'm just doing this on milliseconds just for reasons of simplicity. Uh, a proper analysis of this uh, would not assume uh, normal residuals. Then we can fit the Bayesian model in exactly the same way. So exactly the same type of formula. Here I'm just running the model in parallel over different processor cores uh, so that it's faster. But you can write essentially the same formula uh, and random effects as you do when you use Elmer. And the estimates of the Bayesian model, because here we're not really using priors. And so again, I'm just doing this uh, for simplicity, but in a real analysis, you would want to think about your priors and you want to incorporate them in the analysis. Uh, but the estimates, if we don't worry about priors, um, are essentially very, very similar to the ones that would be obtained in frequentist statistics. But again, this is the mean of the full posterior distribution. We can actually plot the effects and we see that these two conditions were much faster than the control condition uh, using GGEM means. But what's more important is we can look at the random effects. And when we look at the random effects, what we see is that the correlations between the random intercepts and the random slopes or between the two random slopes are actually estimated at some value that is reasonable rather than this crazy one or minus one. And in fact, they're not even large. This is a correlation of 0.2. This is a correlation of 0.17. And what the Bayesian model is doing is trying to also estimate the uncertainty about these correlations. And as you can see, these posteriors are very, very wide. They could be very negative or very positive. And so indeed, what is happening is that the frequentist model, because of that uncertainty, isn't really able to reach a proper solution. But also these values changed a little bit because of that. And so if we go back to the frequentist model, we can see that we had about 10 milliseconds random slope. So the variation across subjects was 10 milliseconds for derivational priming and less than five for inflectional priming. So one was about half of the other. In the Bayesian model, where we can estimate uh, variance components better, we actually see that they turn out to have almost exactly the same magnitude, so the same variation across subjects. So messing up the correlation parameter could change your estimates, and by and large, the estimates of a Bayesian model will be more um, better, more believable when it comes to the random variance components, because Elmer sometimes struggles uh, finding uh, the right estimates for, for the variance components. All of these things are accompanied, of course, by confidence intervals as well, which we didn't get in the frequentist model. So I can look at the variation across subjects, the random slope for derived for derivational priming, and I have not only the estimate of nine milliseconds of standard deviation, but some bounds, uh, credible intervals that tell me how big or how small this variation could be. It's actually very uncertain as well. So we can see that it goes from basically zero to 24 milliseconds, but we can see that it is not really different between the two conditions, derivational and inflectional. Finally, one very cool thing that we can do with Bayesian models, this is just what I said, that the correlation parameter and the various components are better estimate. One very cool thing that one can do with Bayesian models is 
because each of these quantities is a posterior distribution and a full distribution, we can just compare these distributions to one another simply by subtracting them. I already mentioned that we could do all sorts of operations on the posteriors. And for example, I can go to the random slopes and I can directly compare the amount of variation for one random slope with the amount of variation for the other random slope. And this allows me to answer questions such as this. Is there more between subject variants for one type of priming or the other? So I can actually quantify the amount of between subject variants and compare conditions in terms of how variable they are. So in terms of the amount of their individual differences, in this case, subjects, but one could also do that over items like Ian and George um, said. And so we can simply subtract the posterior samples that uh, one parameter had with the other one. I'm just subtracting the two random slopes, subtract, subtracting the 4,000 samples for one and the other random slope. And I arrive at a comparison of variances between the two conditions. In this case, it's basically zero. Of course, we saw that the two conditions were essentially the same. But in other data sets, this will tell you that certain effects are more variable than others. Um, I hope to have convinced you that indeed some of these advantages are very, very uh, useful. I'm just going to conclude by mentioning specifically for bilingualism research uh, why these advantages can be um, very, very useful. Um, one, of course, is that we are usually trying to figure out what happens in different groups from L2 speakers, different proficiency levels, heritage speakers, whatever it may be, different types of bilinguals. Uh, and so oftentimes we are very interested in this notion of the magnitudes of effects. Another important reason is that we have a lot of prior information in bilingualism research, and a lot of this prior information comes from studies with monolinguals, with L1 speakers, and then we also have a lot of uh, studies that have been conducted with a particular population that we're researching. And so we can bring all of this knowledge about a task and the population and the measure uh, into our models. Another important reason to use Bayesian models is that we have substantial heterogeneity between and within individuals. Um, and this, as I've shown you now, can be quantified and even compared in different groups or different conditions. Uh, finally, uh, we use many different data types, tasks, and measures in bilingualism research. Um, I haven't shown you this, but Bayesian models are incredibly flexible, and so we can fit all sorts of different models for different types of, of data, uh, including very customized models. Um, and maybe here are some examples. If we are dealing with RTs, we might choose a log normal or a shifted log normal distribution, just like George was saying. Uh, if we're looking at accuracy, we can fit different types of count uh, or families for categorical variables. If we're trying to analyze ratings, for example, self-ratings uh, self of proficiency um, or other language profile variables, we can fit ordinal models. I have a paper about that in BLC explaining how to fit Bayesian ordinal models. And we have all sorts of other more complicated models that can be suited to the task at hand. Uh, and with that, I conclude my presentation. Uh, do ask questions in the q and I think we've done just a little over no, one hour in this talk. Do ask questions in the Q&A and we have some time for that. I will also be handling questions on GAMS even though I didn't do that talk, but if I'm able to help you can also ask questions about GAMS um, or about the whole session. And then if Ian and George want, or Chris, you can jump in as well. Thank you. Uh, should I pick question, go through the questions and ask them yeah, as well? <clears throat> yeah. Okay, here's, here's a very general one on something you weren't able to touch for, I think, time reasons. So Stephen asks, I'm just tipping my toes into Bayesian analysis and have been drawn towards regions of practical equivalence or rope as a way to, to help qualify the, the posterior distributions. Do you have any advice or feedback on using um, such approaches? You're on mute, I think. 
You are mute, Joel. You you can see my slides, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's one uh, very important advantage as well of, of Bayesian approaches, even though I focus on estimation, if we want to do hypothesis testing, there are a few options around. Maybe the most uh, common or influential ones have been base factors and this one rope or the region of practical equivalence. Um, both have their uses and, and, and staunch supporters. I, I really like the, the rope approach because it allows us to do hypothesis testing on the basis of the posteriors that we have estimated. And so what Krushka asks us to do is to define a region of practical equivalence of very small values in which we say, look, if my posterior is really within these bounds, then the effect is too small to matter. So for all practical purposes is zero, for all scientific purposes is zero, because it's just too small uh, to have scientific importance. And so if you apply this rope, what you, what you do is you grab your credible interval. In this case, it's a highest density interval, which is similar. And you see whether this is contained within the rope. And if it is fully contained within the rope, the 95% interval, then you would say, I accept the null hypothesis. If it's fully outside the rope, then you would say, I reject the null hypothesis. And if there's overlap between the, the bounds, then you would say, well, this is inconclusive. Uh, of course, one reason why people might not use this so much is because it, it, it might force you to, to say that certain effects are inconclusive even if the vast majority of the posterior are on one side. So even if your effect is clearly positive, but then might overlap with the rope. And I think people are generally speaking unwilling of to, to implement procedures that, uh, that uh, reduce the chances of finding effects, so to speak. Uh, but in general, I think this is a really good uh, exercise that has these two big advantages. One is it forces you to think how small is too small to matter. Would a one millisecond effect be enough? Would 1% in eye fixations be uh, enough to matter for this theory? And the other one is that it's a procedure that you can conduct after you do posterior estimation. So it's a procedure that you can conduct in tandem with doing the estimation. So you can grab your posterior and then have this layer of decision, so to speak, on top of the estimates of your model, which I like. It's a kind of an integration between estimation and hypothesis testing. Um, I don't know if I have any, any more practical advice about this. I just took this time to explain what this was because other people in the audience might not know. Um, I, I personally like it and it's something that I would like to see the field use more, yeah. I guess one of the difficulties will be finding a standard within a subfield for how large the rope should be. Basically, I think that's I think what people worry about. Yeah, and then we get into things like um, these very general uh, estimates, probably standardized for a field. And Krushka actually recommends something like minus zero point one to zero point one as a standardized effect. So imagine that you have a standardized regression coefficient. Um, and he says, look, 0.1 to minus 0.1 to 0.1, this is really very small uh, under all accounts. And so this could be a general rope if you don't have any more uh, specifics. Um, if, if you have good theories and good models that would predict certain kinds of effects, then, for example, computational models, mathematical models, et cetera, perhaps that would, would go a long way in in trying to decide what is too small to matter for certain theories, yeah. Okay, uh, a <clears throat> few, uh, few questions now about uh, different effects and also priors. So when you time the age of acquisition of German by 10 to estimate the priming effects of a 10 year difference of age of acquisition, is this built on the assumption that priming effects will change line linearly over time? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, I don't know where that is anymore, but indeed it is. Um, and I, I mean, the whole model, the, the whole model is, 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 is predicated on that, right? So it's not so much the multiplication by 10. It's, we could also say that when you look at the effect per one year, it's also 
predicated or conditioned on the assumption that that the effect is linear. Yeah, and and that is just uh, an assumption of the model that we make, and we say, give me the best fitting line. Is it plausible that it's nonlinear? Yes, from age of acquisition research, we would probably believe that uh, that some of these effects are nonlinear. And I mean, if I go back to the plot, I don't actually believe that this, um, where is it again, sorry. I don't actually believe that this will continue uh, going down forever. I don't actually believe that somebody who is 60 years old and starts learning a second language would show minus 200 milliseconds. So yeah, I think a better model would have to contemplate that and that could actually be GAMPS. Um, in this paper, we almost had no individuals in this region. And so it would be very hard to estimate that. But if we had more data throughout the whole range, something like GAMS would be the ideal approach to estimate such nonlinearities, yeah. This actually feeds into a question we had a lot earlier during mine and George's talk was, which was, do we need to check the normality of the predictors in a mixed effects model? Um, we would check the normality of the residuals. Um, so we would check the normality of the residuals and you can inspect your dependent variable. As for the normality of the predictors, I guess it's a lot less important. Uh, I'm not going to say that it's completely irrelevant. I mean, you want your predictors to be distributed in a certain way. And if they're not- Like, like if you have age- to if, think a little if bit. If you have age as a predictor, you might want to, should I do log age or should I just use- Right. right, that is that is that is true. Imagine that you have frequency as a predictor. We think that frequency effects, lexical frequency effects, uh, uh, probably follow some sort of log function. So, um, so so certain predictors with very high values could benefit from being log transformed. That is true. Um, and another thing that matters is is whether uh, whether if you want to make conclusions about this whole range, whether the range is properly distributed. And I think I've shown you the plot in this uh, data set and we have a huge gap here without any participants and then only two there. So really this study is conducted up to here and anything beyond that doesn't really matter much in terms of uh, inference. Um, and so ideally we'd want something a bit more distributed. But for example, if it was uniformly distributed, that's not a normal distribution and that would be perfectly fine and even advantages. So you don't necessarily want uh, less people at the extremes. It could be uniformly distributed and I don't, I don't think it would come with any disadvantage. Now there's two questions on priors, one a bit more specific and one a bit more general. So. How did you derive the plus minus five milli? How, how did the plus minus five millisecond derive from or give the prior mean equal zero two point comma two point five? So I am stipulating here that I would like my prior to be a normal distribution. And this is not necessary, by the way. And BRMS allows different distributions for priors. Um, and in some cases, they might even be better. Um, here I'm just sticking to normal distributions and one of the reasons is precisely because we know very well how normal distributions behave and in particular we know that 95% of the mass of a normal distribution is between the mean plus or minus two SDs and so when I say that I want a prior that is a mean of zero and 2.5 standard deviation what I'm really saying is or what I'm additionally saying is that there is before seeing the data a 95% probability that the effect is minus five to five milliseconds per year. And this is because it's two SDs uh, in a normal distribution that match the 95% of the mass. Um, this is just one way of, of, of thinking of priors. You could plot them and that's very useful. You could actually plot your prior that you've chosen or different kinds of priors so that you have a sense, okay, if I'm using the blue one, well, it's not that unlikely that it might be 150. Is this really what I want to express? If I'm using the red one, I'm saying, well, it shouldn't really, it's almost impossible that it's more than 50. And so plotting the prior is a very good idea to distinguish between them. 
at some point when you have a lot of priors and a lot of parameters, and this happens very, very quickly, they start, of course, also interacting with one another, and, and there are many parameters in a model. Um, what you would want to do is conduct what we call prior predictive checks. So you would like to set up your priors and then simulate data from the model only on the basis of the priors and see what kind of data such priors would predict. And then if the shapes and the ranges are reasonable, then uh, you can move, move along with these priors. If they are very extreme and they're predicting things with, uh, uh, you know, 10,000 millisecond effects or whatever, you know that your priors are probably too wide. Uh, this is very easy to conduct with the RMS. Uh, it's basically one function called PP check. Uh, you first fit the model only with the priors, and then you can do this PP check function to see what data from those priors would look like. Given your expert knowledge, you will see if this, if what the model predicts makes sense, if it matches your expectations, so to speak. Okay. Now there's uh, a much more general question about priors. So if we were to estimate the prior of the priming effect, or I guess it could be any other effect that we're interested in, is the prior, is it the means of the priming effect of all relevant studies with a similar design? So how, okay, I guess it's, how do you decide what the, the prior is? I guess in the yeah. ideal world, it would basically, it would be based on all of the available data, right? Yeah. Um... It's it's a bit tricky, and of course, this is also a problem. For example, with meta analysis in in general, right? I mean, what 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 should go in? What is similar enough? Each study is different, so what is similar enough to be aggregated as as the same effect, so to speak? And this is kind of a, a tricky question. The way I tend to think about this is is in terms of different levels. So I think about look, I know that no effect that I do will be more than, say, a one standard deviation effect. No, no, no manipulation that I do in the tasks that I use will, have, will be so large as being one or two uh, Cohen's D. That would just be extreme. And so I know that in my field, effects tend to be smaller than that. I know that in priming tasks, effects will never be larger than, say, 100 milliseconds, certainly not in mask priming. And so I can start zooming in. I'm thinking about the field. I'm thinking then about bilingual populations. Then I think about priming tasks. Then I think about priming tasks, uh, mask priming tasks. Then I think about mask priming tasks in all two populations. And then at some point, uh, I'll see if my prior can respect all these levels. But one can draw this expert knowledge at different levels, I think. And maybe that helps. Um, other times, you can really, really go for the specific meta-analysis that was conducted. If, if it was you or somebody else conducting that meta-analysis of a certain phenomenon, then you can literally grab that posterior, especially if it was a Bayesian meta-analysis, and you would grab that posterior and turn it into the prior of a new experiment. Or you can, for example, grab the posterior of experiment one and turn that into the prior of experiment two into the prior of the analysis of experiment two. And if the studies are similar enough, at some point, I think this is uh, justified. At the yeah. same time, yeah. Another general guideline that I like is try to spread it out a bit. So you wouldn't really, really put exactly your beliefs in there because I mean, I know that priming effects will probably, probably not be larger than say 30, 40 milliseconds. If I really, really put that there, it's going to be quite a tight prior. So I like to think, what, what are the bounds of the effect that I really believe in? And then I like to spread it out a bit. And by spreading it out a bit, you're essentially allowing for the possibility that uh, the data uh, will also contribute something to, to, your, to your conclusions. Yeah, but I think, I think, as you said, a good idea is if you're running a replication study, you know, your first experiment can be the, form the prior for can form the prize for the second one. And also, in general, if we're trying to estimate an effect across the literature, this this is why keeping your having your data open will help help you quantify this in a more systematic in a more systematic way rather than just uh, less systematic. Yeah, ways. yeah. I, ideally, in this 
given that Bayesian statistics is so useful for this process of cumulative knowledge, because it's really kind of formalizing this prior to posterior to prior. Um, yeah, ideally we would um, um, upload all our data and then conduct uh, not only meta-analysis, but cumulative meta-analysis as more data comes in. And we would do these meta-analysis in a Bayesian framework and then see our, our our beliefs are being updated as 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 the years go by and as science progresses. Yeah, we're still a bit of a long way from that, but there's been a lot of movement in that direction. Certainly, when it comes to data transparency, um, Bayesian meta analysis, at least in psycholinguistics, have already started uh, appearing as well. Um, and so, I think we're moving there. Yeah. Hey, we don't have any more questions on Bayes, but there are some questions on GAMS. If you want to try and Go on to GAMS. I can have a go. I can yeah. have a go. Um, we will see. Uh, bear in mind, as well, didn't give the presentation. So, <laughs> so um, firstly, are GAMS only or primarily used for longitudinal data? And also, um, is there a reason why you would use GAMS over something else like growth curve analysis? Um, so growth curve analysis is, is um, essentially the application of polynomials. And so instead of having, let's say, age or whatever it may be, time, you, you now have a quadratic component or a cubic component there that will give it a certain curvature. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And growth curve has been used uh, in bilingualism, for example, for the analysis of visual world studies. But we need to remember that it specifies a particular functional form. So if you put a quadratic predictor in there, it's saying, well, I'm hoping to get the quadratic curve. If I put a cubic predictor in there, then at most you'll have this kind of cubic shape. Uh, just like a straight line, if you don't put any of those things in there, then the only thing you can get out of your model is a straight line like we've talked about before. And so you're specifying the shape. Nothing wrong with that. It's it's again the the logic of statistical modeling. But, but what do you get with GAMS is that you don't need to conform to such shapes. And so for certain tasks and measures, again, I'll, I'll mention visual world, oftentimes these shapes, depending on when you start measuring, when you start counting over time, oftentimes you will get shapes that don't neatly fit into quadratic or cubic functions. Uh, and so at that point, uh, GAMs are, are really useful for, for the flexibility of giving you any possible shape. Imagine, for example, for ERPs in which you have uh, a voltage wave of a certain component and how, I don't know, imagine a P600 that might not fit very neatly into uh, a growth curve model. Um, at the same time, and this is also important, GAMs have principled ways not to overfit. So if you just gave it all the freedom in the world, then the GAM would just try to get to every data point and it would completely overfit the data and you would have super wiggliness. Uh, GAMs are, are function in a principled way such that they constrain the model. It's, it's actually a Bayesian principle. So the way it works is really in a Bayesian way that it's like you have a prior that says, I cannot move too fast. I cannot become super sudden, super wiggly. I cannot just go up immediately, except if there's a lot of evidence for it. So it's really kind of like the prior and the likelihood fighting against one another. And so because GAMs are implementing that, this might not work in every situation, but basically we're getting the flexibility of getting whatever curve the data might show without overfitting the data. If the best model is a straight line, the GAM will return a straight line. If the best model is some crazy shape, it might return that crazy shape. And that's a really, I think, awesome advantage um, relative to growth curve modeling. There are others. In GAM models, for example, you can model autocorrelation. Uh, this is something that happens in longitudinal data, in time series data, that each step in time is related to the one before. Um, and this can be incorporated into the GAM model uh, also in BRMS, for example. And in fact, GAMs can be run inside BRMS as well. Um, and so all these things uh, can be integrated, yeah. But this is another advantage compared to using LME4, uh, Elmer, uh, with, with which one cannot easily specify correlation structures. <laughs> 
Okay, cool. Just try and quickly get in one final question from Nan. So um, kind of two parts. Um, firstly, is there a principled way for picking your window size in the gap in analysis with GAM? Could you go for shorter versus longer windows? Uh, for example, in a visual world experiment, you might not be sure where the effect is going to be. And also, is it is it possible to extract the parameters of the curves from GAMs to compare key parts of the curves rather than comparing the entire curve? Wow, those are really interesting questions. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll address the second one first. This is also something fantastic about GAMs is that we can look then at the model's predictions and we can ask for more information, so to speak. And we're doing that at the moment um, in collaboration with Sol Lago. I'm developing a method that uh, attempts to do that precisely, which is answer the question uh, of at which point in time these two curves start diverging. And what we can do is based on different methods, we can get a distribution for that. So we can get a credible interval, so to speak. And we can say things such as, I think these two conditions differ at start deferring at 100 milliseconds with an interval that goes between 50 to 200. So at the latest, they start deferring at 200, at the earliest at 50, which could be useful for uh, processing uh, research, of course. But, but it highlights uh, beyond the specifics of this method, it highlights how we can look then at the predictions of the model and compute further metrics. For example, when do they first start deferring and even do other methods that could give us intervals on that and quantify our uncertainty around that. So yeah, that is that is possible. Once you have the predictions, you can do more things with them. Um, and the first question of whether one can define a time window, I think so. So because of that, because the GAMs have the flexibility to to, to show effects at different points in time because they're not constrained to be a certain shape. You could also not do it and, and you hope that the GAM figures out where the effect is more so than a growth curve model. At the same time, yes, the model is somehow constrained. Like I said, you don't want very, very sudden effects. And so, and there are even further constraints about whether the degree of smoothness is, is preserved throughout the curve. And so I'm not going to say that it's irrelevant. Sometimes you may get better statistical inference if you reduce, for example, the first 200 milliseconds in a, if you just eliminate the first, let's say, uh, 200 milliseconds in a visual world experiment, especially if it starts basically from zero. So if your fixations are starting from zero and you really start measuring at the onset of the stimulus, uh, the sentence even, then these estimates close to 0% start becoming very difficult to estimate. And in those cases, I would chop off the beginning, yes. And I don't think there's a problem with that. Okay, cool. I think we're running out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks, everyone, for your questions, and thanks, Joel, for your response.